I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free word. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London with an audience of distinguished experts and one or two enthusiastic amateurs like me. We are talking about Venezuela. Just a couple of weeks ago, it was at the top of the news agenda. Donald Trump even said he had military options on the table in regard to the civil unrest going on in Venezuela. They, of course, were hostile to Venezuela long before the civil unrest. In fact, even when things were going tip-top in Venezuela, the United States government at the time uh, maintained a posture of hostility towards it. I have frequently visited Venezuela. I had the honor of being a participant in the final as it turned out, election battle won by the late president, Hugo Chavez, a great hero for people throughout the world. I saw for myself with my own eyes the transformations wrought by the Bolivarian Revolution, as described by President Chavez and his successor, President Maduro, and the great movement that is ranged alongside them. The transformation is uh, kind of obvious even to the uh, untutored observer. Uh, Venezuela has the largest student body as a percentage of its population of any country in the world. It had a policy that every child in the country should have a laptop computer. It built universities by the score, schools by the hundreds, houses for poor people by the tens of thousands of units. It sought, by using this vast oil reserve that it has, to change the balance of wealth and power in its country. It would be wrong to describe it as a, a communist country. It isn't. And it has many significant differences to Cuba, for example, with whom it enjoys great friendship. In Cuba, the private capitalist class has been expropriated. In fact, in Venezuela, the private capitalist class has not just been not uh, expropriated, but is still alive and kicking the very government which has allowed it to prosper. I make that point because it is a commonplace to seek to paint Venezuela as some kind of communist dictatorship. As a matter of fact, the Venezuelan political leaders have been elected in free and fair elections more often, more regularly than any other political leaders anywhere in the world. In fact, it's difficult to imagine a place where there have been more elections and more referenda, which have been more perfectly carried out. I use the word perfectly because that's what Jimmy Carter described as the uh, conduct of the last presidential election of President Chavez. He described it as pristine. He described it as better than any American election. A former president of the United States who knows a thing or two about elections throughout the world. I once had a celebrated encounter with a young student at Oxford University, which many millions have watched on YouTube, in which he attempted to tell me, who had just returned that day from Venezuela, that the opposition leader had been kept off the television during the presidential elections. Not only had he not been kept off the television, I was sick looking at him on the television. There were dozens of television stations, private capitalist TV stations, on which wall to wall you could hear the honeyed words of the Venezuelan opposition. Chavez died, Maduro succeeded him, was re-elected as president, albeit with a slimmer majority than Chavez had enjoyed, 
and the opposition stepped up their efforts to overthrow the government, to change the state, and to alter the course of events in Venezuela. That, of course, being entirely their right in a democratic country. What was, I think, clearly not their right was to use United States money and all the tools of subversion honed over more than half a century in the United States to subvert and ultimately to overthrow the government and defy the wishes of the Venezuelan people freely expressed in <laughs> referenda and elections. And then, in the last period of this present crisis, to ask for, to plead for, to demand a foreign invasion of their own country. The leaders of the Venezuelan opposition have openly called for United States intervention in their country's internal affairs. Now, the current Secretary of State for the US, uh, Rex Tillerson, is of course the former head of Exxon, the largest oil company in the world. You could see why he might be interested in Venezuela. So a crisis has developed as the oil price fell and as I believe errors were made in the governance of Venezuela, but mainly because the United States has decided that regime change in Venezuela is not just in their interest, but is potentially possible. And so the US has gone full monte, as we say here in England, to try and get rid of the Chavistas, the followers of the late Hugo Chavez. So we have this audience of distinguished experts who include amongst them the most distinguished of all. The first, the finest and twice mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, who is not just a champion of poor people and the oppressed all over the world and has paid a high price for it, could show us his scars uh, were he uh, of that kind, which he isn't. He met Chavez many times and actually cemented an, a formal relationship between London under his mayorship and the Bolivarian revolutionary country of Venezuela. So who better to open the show than the great Ken Livingstone? Go ahead, Ken. What's your view on it? Well, thank you, George. I think what was striking, uh, it almost didn't happen because I'd heard that Chavez wanted to come to London. Um, he was a, on a private visit and Tony Blair, the then Prime Minister, had told the Metropolitan Police, do not provide any armed protection. Really? And the objective was, of course, he wouldn't then be able to come. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I had a bit more influence over the Metropolitan Police at the time, um, and I was able to say, no, you've got to provide armed protection. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to come into the country. So I knew immediately there must be something really good about this guy if Tony Blair wanted to keep <laughs> Tony him out Tony Blair of wanted him shot. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, what just struck me was, I mean, absolutely charismatic, I, but just a really nice guy. I mean, you've, you've met so many politicians like I have who are intolerable, just filled with arrogance, just about themselves. Here was a guy who was just there to do what he could for the people of Venezuela and around the world. And I mean, what people most, most don't remember is that once the Soviet Union collapsed, support for Cuba from Russia stopped. They had a terrible few years. And if it hadn't been Chavez coming to power in 98 and then putting money in, I mean, the whole Cuban um, government might have been overthrown. I mean, it was really on the point of collapse at the end. So this is a man I would have trusted with my life. And oddly enough, I mean, he didn't come into politics. I, I, he didn't grow up thinking I might be a politician. He was in the army. He was caught up fighting guerrillas. And I remember at one point he said that what changed his mind I, about his life and what was happening in Venezuela because you had these 200 families that owned virtually everything in Venezuela. It didn't matter who got elected, they just did what these oligarchs wanted them to do. And they'd been fighting a, a left-wing guerrilla organisation. And Chavez had one of, his, one of his men was shot in one of the exchanges and he held him while he died in his arms. 
And it's at that moment he thought, this can't go on. And then he, he attempted a coup. He did time in prison. The moment he got out, he was massively elected. And I just think people just think, here's a person who came into politics to help others, not to get rich themselves, like so many have. Quite so. And everything uh, there I, I endorse. And I think uh, virtually everyone watching this will do so too. It's difficult to follow an act like Hugo Chavez. Yeah. There's only one Hugo Chavez. It's difficult to try and fill his shoes. That task fell. Again, uh, he didn't wish for it. He wanted Chavez to live forever, as indeed in some senses he will. Uh, he's a former uh, bus driver uh, and train driver and transport worker. Nicolas Maduro, we both knew him when he was the foreign minister. He's had to step into the breach. He did win the subsequent presidential election, but not by much. Is this change, you think, the key reason why uh, things have gone uh, in a more difficult direction well, in Venezuela? I mean, there's most likely no other country. As you said, it's got the largest oil reserves in the world. When the oil price collapsed by half, that was devastating. And I mean, the last time I was in Venezuela, I, it was 2008, and I was just saying, I, I'd been invited to come out because it was the mayoral election for Caracas. And Caracas is a nightmare. I mean, it's just gridlock. They need massive investment in infrastructure. And Chavez wanted me to provide advice on what to do um, for his candidate. But tragically, I, the right wing, the opposition, held that and they were some kind of dictatorship isn't it yeah, where the yes. mayorship of caracas is won yeah. by the right-wing opposition and, and this is the tragedy so i mean they haven't had that big wave of investment they need to diversify their economy away from oil um and then of course you've had america step in with all sorts of attempts to undermine those oligarchs who still own a vast amount of the world I, I, the rumours are that they're stopping food and medicines coming into the country to undermine the government. And literally, there's nothing new about this. All my life, I, governments all over the third world have been overthrown the moment they start to insist the wealth in that country goes to their people and not to American corporations. And I just, I mean, I think we'd be quite surprised they haven't already had Maduro shot by an assassin. Isn't it, uh, well, sadly, we're both old enough to remember it, the days leading up to the overthrow of the popular unity government in Chile. Mm. Exactly the same uh, game plan, really, uh, and, to create shortages deliberately and to subvert the economy and to try and mobilise popular opposition to the socialist government. And America didn't just do that in Latin America. Remember, they did it in Greece back in the 1970s. You had a, a socialist... In Indonesia in the yeah, 60s. All over. The, and the trouble is, it takes 20 or 30 years for the truth to come out and the documents to be revealed. And I, mean, I can remember... I mean, I'm just about old enough to remember the Brazilian government being overthrown back in 1964. We all told you it was chaos, it was you know, you know, it all, you know, a disaster, they were hopeless. No, they just decided they were going to actually use the reserves I mean, for their people, not for American corporations. And the same thing was done. The economy was undermined, the generals were encouraged to coup. And you mentioned Chile, but the, the thing that we didn't discover for decades was that the week before the coup, Henry Kissinger, who was Septi of State of America, flew into Chile to have a private meeting with the generals to discuss that coup. I mean, all my life I've just watched America destroy democratic rights all over the rest of the world. Lastly, uh, for now, uh, Trump shocked a lot of people, even in Washington, when he insisted that military options were on the table in dealing with, uh, with the issue of Venezuela. On one level, Trump's got too many problems on his plate to contemplate it. But uh, again, in our lifetime, they did invade Cuba. Could they invade Venezuela? I think there's going to be a real problem because that would clearly be illegal. I mean, you couldn't do it without a United Nations resolution. They're never going to get that. And I think the first thing that would happen, I mean, the size of American troops arriving would mobilize support behind Maduro's regime, and people would fight on the streets to defeat that. But Trump's stupid enough to do it. I mean, I, I don't think there's a great history of foreign policy experience in Donald Trump. 
Indeed, and he's now a captive of the generals, as yes. he himself tweeted today uh, from Camp David. He said, I'm in Camp David, I'm surrounded, very interesting word, by our very fine generals. <laughs> uh, so they're discussing military options somewhere. Who'd like to... Uh, uh, Isaac, has to be you. You're our uh, chief Latin American expert. Isaac Biggio, please. Um, I think that if the United States enter in Venezuela, we are going to have a worse a scenario worse than Iraq, Libya or Syria, because it is going to spread to Colombia, it is going to destroy the peace process in Colombia, it's going to spread to Brazil, it's going to spread to Ecuador, to Peru, where we have a war. So it's going to be a, one of the worst war you can ever imagine. The Venezuelan people have a history of fighting uh, colonial oppression. The Venezuelan were the people that have more debts during the independence movement 200 years ago. And if the USA enter in Venezuela, I think we are going to have millions of people dying. It's going to completely destabilize the region, destabilize the democracy in the region, and it's going to be a terrible situation. And I think that it could be also the end of Donald Trump. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. Invasion might well be, for all the reasons you <clears throat> and Ken mentioned, uh, untenable. Uh, but a continuation of the economic war and the propaganda war against Venezuela is very likely, isn't it? Yes, I also want to say two things. Trump doesn't have any authority to criticize Maduro because he's the only president in world history that has lost a direct election by three million votes. No, no other person. And the second thing is I think that the, the right-wing opposition is coming to um, a, a difficult time. They tried to boycott the Constituent Assembly and they didn't manage to do so. And now, with the polarization with Trump, I think that Maduro is going to have more popularity. Maduro is trying to have new elections in two months' time, and they are going, he's going to put the opposition in a difficult situation in these regional elections. So I think that it might be possible that after October, the situation is going to change in Venezuela, and the right-wing opposition is not going to have the same arguments that they have now. They claim that they have 7 million people voting, but we have in London, they say that in London they have 7,000 people voting, and there are no 7,000 Venezuelans uh, that can vote in this country. So I think that there's a lot of in inflation regarding their numbers, and I think that after October, the situation is going to change uh, if this situation happens, and Trump is only making Maduro to be strong at this moment. Now, you wouldn't claim, I don't think, that the government has made no mistakes. Uh, I certainly wouldn't, whether you agree or not. Uh, and one of them, uh, Ken Livingston, got into some difficulty in saying this, so let me say it rather than him. If you're going to have a revolution, if you half make a revolution, in the words of a uh, great French revolutionary, uh, Saint-Just, if you half make a revolution, you're digging your own grave. Uh, and there hasn't actually been a revolution in Venezuela. The word revolution is tossed around. The word socialism is tossed around. I was present when Fidel Castro advised President Chavez uh, not to talk about socialism so much, but to actually do it. One of the mistakes is that all of this power has been left in the hands of an absolutely toxic oligarchy. Or would you say I'm being unfair? Uh, no, capitalism has not been overthrown in Venezuela. There is a capitalist class, as you said. There's private companies, there is the US companies. So they have not overthrown the capitalist class. So Venezuela is not a Cuba. And one of the reasons why the opposition every time come and come is because they have not been overthrown. So they claim that there is a dictatorship, but in reality, they have not suffered a, a revolutionary dictatorship. And if you allow me, I also would like to take the opportunity to congratulate Ken. I am, as a, I am a Jewish, and I fully, uh, I fully accept Ken Livingston's position on Israel. I fully endorse you, and it's very unfair. 
it's, it's very unfair that you have been removed from the Labour Party for that reason. Thank you. Very, uh, very good. Uh, who would like to uh, contribute briefly? Yes, madam. Just continue, continuing on the idea that Isaac was uh, expressing, just to look at the pharmaceutical sector in Venezuela, 193 companies, all private, are responsible to import all the, med all the medicines that we consume in the country. Of those, just 10, they 50% uh, of all the dollars given to them to import these important uh, medicines. And the, 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 according to the figures, despite the fact that the government has given them more and more divisas or dollars every year, the uh, amount of medicines has, uh, has um, fallen. Has fallen or actually has kept constant and they have made money, so it means that they have been uh, over-invoicing in the money that the government has given to these companies, and in fact there are studies that say that from every $10 that the government gives to companies like that, like those, $7 actually never really are used to buy the produce they say they're going to bring to Venezuela. So, and so we have to understand that this is a real boycott and a war, economic war, that is happening every day and has been increased since 2013. It's sabotage. It's a sabotage, it's a boycott. We have to call it how it is. And this is one of the difficulties that the government has to deal with. And uh, on top of that, the price of oil, which has gone down and obviously have reduced the in income. Hold that thought. We'll come back to you later. We've got to take a break. Kale Mahora on Al Maidin Television with me, George Galloway, in London, discussing Venezuela. Earlier, we took the Kale Mahora camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. Take a look at this. Was the uprising in Venezuela another U.S. intervention plan? Uh, to an extent, maybe. You know, they've got a history of it, haven't they? So, you know, it's been going on for centuries, so countries invading each other and... You can point fingers at the US, there probably is some involvement, but the underlying issue is economic instability, which is oil. Uh, possibly, yeah. Do you believe the votes in the election, the last election in Venezuela, were manipulated? It's hard to tell. I'd like to have more time to consider it. You know, it's like that phrase, you know, don't speak while the wheel is still in turn. Because it's no use just kind of saying, oh, I'm against this. Because you don't know, you know. It's like this demand that you should have an opinion, a politician. Given the fact that there were people who went into the house of opposition figures and abducted them, military, like paramilitary and military and police forces, that points to an autocratic, fascistic regime that would definitely would have no problem with manipulating things like that. So I'd say that there's... Vote manipulation doesn't seem like a large stretch to me. It seems very plausible. Well, you can see there uh, quite a level of cynicism and quite a level of acceptance of the hostile propaganda against Venezuela, which has actually been worst in the most liberal sections of the media. The English newspaper, The Guardian, could be said to be the leading critic of Venezuela, not just now, but actually for many years uh, under uh, President Chavez and uh, Maduro. So I happen to think that most of those people were wrong, but that doesn't mean that that's not a widespread point of view in Western countries. W were you surprised at the level of cynicism there? No, not at all. The level of media um, demonization of Venezuela is, is toxic. It reaches level of intoxication. I have the responsibility, as it were, of following the Guardian every single day. And over the last 12, 15 years, I think they've written two articles which are reasonably balanced. All the rest of them, and this is no exaggeration because it went through one by one, are absolutely negative, biased, distorted, misrepresentation and even fake news. Um, so therefore, if you are subjected to that level of 
intoxication literally every single day. And one can mention other media, not to name any BBCs, for example, which is very similar. And therefore, all the rest of the media just repeat the stuff. And when it comes to the election, which is very interesting, the opposition organized a plebiscite on the 16th of July, which is illegal. And this dictatorship allowed them to do it. And they claim by about 4 or 5 p.m. of that day that 7 million people are cast over for their preference, which was against the National Constituent Assembly. But in the evening of that very day, say 6, 7 p.m., publicly, they burned all the electoral material, all of it. Therefore, it is impossible to know whether it's true that they got 7 million votes or not. When it came to the election of the National Constituent Assembly, more than 8 million votes actually were cast. These are computerized, organized by the National Electoral Council, and totally auditable. Already 54% of these votes have been audited by the National Electoral Council. And they're available to anybody who wants to. I've made this point on television on a few occasions. What is interesting, I made this point very forcefully, is that the media accepted the 7 million without any question whatsoever, knowing full well of the dodginess of it, as well as the burning of the electoral material. And whereas they are absolutely prepared to cast doubt on the 8 million votes that actually were, took place on that day. And what is more interesting about this, and this is why the, the, the media reaches level of intoxication, is that despite these horrible levels of economic war, despite the enormous difficulties that Maduro has faced in these four years, he got 8 million votes, which is the highest number of votes that Chavismo has ever got since 1999. So imagine what you as a strategist are thinking. What do you have to do to these people to stop changing their mind? Mm. If you do all of this to them for four years and they're still supported, and actually the National Constituent Assembly has changed everything quite dramatically, if I may expand Please. on this a little bit. Number one, the main task of the National Constituent Assembly was to bring about peace. And this is what happened. There is no more violence in the streets in Venezuela. None. So, number one, the killings by the opposition, by armed facts, paid and organized by the opposition, stopped. And number three, the United States, therefore, has decided, since their proxies have failed miserably in their job of overthrowing the government, the United States decided to take central stage. And Trump, in a very, not very diplomatic way, actually made the threat that the military option was open. Mike Pence was sent by Trump to tour Latin America to try to get some coalition of the willing, which is their favorite phrase, to see whether they can get something together and then possibly attack Venezuela. None of the countries in Latin America, none, with no exception, including Argentina, Brazil, Mexico and Colombia and Peru made it totally clear in public that they totally opposed this. And the reason is very simple. These right-wing right -wing governments know that any adventure by the United States is doomed to fail quite dramatically. And if that happens, their position is going to be extremely vulnerable because there will be a backlash in the region as a whole over which their position already is vulnerable and unstable. This will magnify you know, the response for the masses. If you look at the trade union organizations, the political parties of the left, that have millions of supporters, uh, millions of votes and so on, absolutely unconditionally, without any question, have supported Maduro and the National Constituent Assembly. So this is the reason why the media has to create the impression that what is going on in Venezuela is something similar to the process leading in the Ukraine to the overthrow of the government, to the civil war in Libya, or to the, the terrible situation in, in Syria. And the media deliberately concentrates, and just one final point, all the violence, absolutely all of it, concentrated in five municipalities, five. The media knows this as well as I do. Yet they deliberately present this as if it's taking place in the country as a whole, and these five municipalities are the equivalent of Knightbridge and Chelsea. So imagine... It's for the international audience. These so are the richest parts is, of London. This is what is going on. So therefore, it is understandable that they are rushing it up, the, the propaganda, in order to see whether they can create some conditions for the United States to be able to 
do something about it. I hope they fail, and I don't think the conditions are going to be great. Do, do you share the, the view of uh, Isaac and Ken that, uh, and these other Latin American leaders that you've just uh, adduced, uh, that uh, no Bay of Pigs could possibly happen in Venezuela? It's very unlikely. I mean, the logistics are very problematic. The armed forces in Venezuela, I'm not an expert necessarily on this field, but the armed forces in Venezuela are quite robust, are being strengthened quite dramatically, and I'm using this terminology deliberately. I think to the point that they are in a position to defend themselves quite nicely. As a matter of constitutional principle, the masses can be organized in militias, and the militia of Venezuela is in the region of 200,000 already, and this is going to be increased to 300,000, possibly to 500,000. In other words, the only possibility that our peoples have is to organize a people's war in the event of a U.S. intervention. And already the preparations are being taken place in Venezuela. So therefore, I think the strategists of the United States are already thinking it might be easy to go in, it might be very difficult to come out. And we know that these people are going to fight to the bitter end. And it's going to dislocate and disorganize absolutely everything that exists already in a very precarious manner in Mexico, for example, in Colombia, for example, and so on. So you can imagine they're going to, you know, hell is going to break loose where the United States to do this. I don't think they, the conditions exist. And uh, what we have to ensure this, we have to ensure that no politician in this country, none, zero politician in this country, has to in any way whatsoever equivocate regarding opposing and rejecting the possibility of a U.S. military um, attack against Venezuela. Well, I can think of a few politicians in this country who wouldn't uh, reject it. Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, the Foreign Secretary of Britain, uh, has been uh, vocal in his attacks on, uh, on Venezuelan democracy, hasn't he? Yeah, but it's just I think they're trying to use it for domestic purposes. <clears throat> And, and it's a real pity that they lie. They're, what they're doing is using it against the opposition Labour Party <clears throat> because the leader of the Labour Party and people like Ken Livingstone are heavily associated with the Venezuelan revolution. That's right. And what they're trying to do with this is trying to demonize the um, Corbyn and the left of the Labour Party, in order to ensure that they put off as many people as possible as a sort of cheap shot, there is no other way to call it, a cheap shot uh, political uh, effort to try to demonize them, saying this is what you can expect, you know, what is going on in Venezuela if they were to be elected, which is completely untrue. But what they're also trying to do is to uh, say that socialism doesn't work. Now, I've made my own view clear. I don't think that what's uh, present or prevalent in Venezuela is socialism. So if it wasn't working, it wouldn't be socialism that wasn't working. But in any case, to what extent is it true that uh, the economy is, is fundamentally unsound in Venezuela as a result of Venezuelan government policy? Well, there is a huge amount of publicity in the media regarding this, and I think most of it is false even from serious publications such as Financial Times. There is, no way, there is no question that there are problems in the Venezuelan economy, no question. In 2008, the price of the barrel of oil was $148. By 2016, January, February, it went down to 23. In other words, Venezuela lost about 83, 85% of its revenue, which is just about the only thing it gets. So these created a bottleneck, which is really impossible and quite difficult at that particular point in time. But ever since, Venezuela has actually paid all of its financial obligations, absolutely every single one of them. Number one, five years ago, 61% of the budget of Venezuela was devoted to social expenditure. The year after, it went, to 60, went up to 64. The year after, it went to 67. The year after, to 71. And the last year, was went up to 73%. And in the last three to four years, the Venezuelan government has built 1.7 million houses for the poor. Now, if you pay all your debts, if you actually are able to increase the social budget by that dimension, if you take steps to ensure that the masses do not lose so much of their standard of living as a result of the economic war that has been going on, 
and then you're actually developing a huge amount. Venezuela is attracting more investment, more for, more for investment than Argentina is right now as we speak because of what is going on in the Orinoco uh, Strip. So if you take all of that into account, it's not true at all. And in the last three months, Venezuela, as a result of the structure for gold, has increased its international research by three tons. And the price of gold in the world market is $41,000. So in three months, which if you actually you know, think of a year or a couple of years, the amount of tons of gold which are going to be introduced as reserves, international reserves, to the Venezuelan economy is going to be dramatic. Venezuela has the highest reserves of gold in the world. It's got thorium. The highest oil reserve and the highest gold reserve. It's got thorium. I can't imagine what the Americans it's, it's, see in it. Now they know. It's got coltan, which is better than titanium. And it's got a few other stuff. And they are developing, particularly in that dimension. So the economy of Venezuela is going to diversify very quickly indeed. And it's got excellent relationship with China in terms of economic terms and so on. China has been incorporated into the Silk Route as somehow a partner which is going to benefit of the expansion that that is going to bring about into the world economy. So by whichever way you look at it, there is no way that that economy is going to um, collapse. More important than that, and I think this is a crucial point, the IMF and the World Bank have zero influence in Venezuela, zero. And this is, this is why the government hasn't taken austerity measures in order to deal with the crisis that it's facing. Um, I think it's a matter of time before Venezuela begins to take off again. It's going to take a while. They have to survive politically first in order to get there, but the potential is absolutely gigantic. And will they survive? Yes. You're absolutely sure about absolutely that? Absolutely sure, especially after the 8 million. And the opposition actually got themselves into so much trouble. They are absolutely divided all over the place. And I was wondering, you know, what is going on? One section are going for broke. Let's go for terrorism and so on, which... I think they will continue to do so. Some others have decided they're going to register for the elections that are taking place. So they're coming back into the fold, as it were, respecting the institutionality of the country. And I was wondering, is this a real division within the opposition? And it's not true. The real division comes from Washington. It is they who are divided. There are those sections who are crazy enough to actually think in terms of terrorism, military invasion, and so on. And there are others who are saying, look, this is not viable. Let's think of something else. Let's accumulate forces, and let's see whether we can defeat them at the game in the elections. But after the uh, election of the National Constituent Assembly, I think the chances of the opposition are extremely slim, and they will continue to go down unless they change their tactics. And what the government are saying in Venezuela is this. The problem in Venezuela regarding the politics, the political stability, is that we do not have a democratic opposition. We have a democratic government, but there is no democratic opposition. It is not our job, they say, to actually shape a democratic opposition. But whatever we can do to ensure that we induce them in that direction, we will do. And it seems to me the National Constituent Assembly has done certainly half percent of the trick. I told you we had... Uh... Uh, eminent uh, experts, and indeed, so far, we have. We'll be right back. You're watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, discussing Venezuela. We've heard... Uh, a lot from supporters of the government in Venezuela. Let's hear a contrary point of view, at least I assume it will be contrary. Sir, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Jerry Downing from Socialist Fight. Uh, I'm not really giving you a contrary position. I'm just saying that, that uh, I strongly agree with your statement where you said uh, about uh, uh, San Just's uh, observation that those that make half a revolution uh, generally uh, end up in the grave. Uh, he made that comment in uh, January of 1893 uh, and uh, he signified his intentions uh, and the intentions uh, of Maximilian Robespierre uh, who actually did make the revolution uh, in the following year. Uh, it was the reign of terror that actually consolidated the French Revolution 
and nothing could ever s go back again to the old feudal ancient regime France. Uh, Chavez didn't do that. Chavez kept a whole section of the old conservative uh, uh, elite, uh, those ones that are now in those five municipalities. Uh, they are the people that are now organizing with the backing of the United States. They are the people that are now launching the, the, the terrorist attacks. Uh, and in fact, most of the deaths are actually caused by them and not by the government. Those, those figures that, that, that are put out, put out uh, are actually bogus figures. The majority of deaths are caused by these terrorist organizations. The difficulty with Chavez and Maduro was that they didn't mobilize their own masses. They didn't mobilize the barrios and they lost the, 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 the elections because they became demoralized uh, at, at, at the situation. Now with the convoking of the Constituent Assembly, there is uh, a great hope that there will be a renewed uh, uh, mobilization. Uh, the, those riots got absolutely no support within the barrios. Uh, the Constituent Assembly is getting support uh, from the uh, from the barriers and from the from the poor, uh, it is uh, the the the, the uh, militias that are being or organised are the correct way to go. But the great fear is that uh, sections within the, the 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 leadership of the army, sections within the the the, the Chavista itself, will seek another compromise. Uh, and we'll end up uh, like we ended up with uh, the other man who made the half a revolution, and that was Allende in, 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 uh, in Chile in 1973. He too made a half a revolution. He too was afraid to take the steps to, to, to arm, the, arm his own supporters. He disarmed them and assured us that, that, that Pinochet was, was uh, quite harmless. He, he was a constitutional politician. Will there be an invasion? If there would be an invasion, they would meet a welcoming committee, wouldn't they, from those five, from those five, from those, those five municipalities. It is a great dangerous situation, uh, I, I think, and it will continue to be dangerous until we get our, our San Just and Robespierre are, are to be uh, uh, more modern until we get our Lenins and Trotskys. Well, that's the opposition, but the left opposition. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go to the lady in the... Second row. Thank you. I'm from Bolivia. And, um, well, um, I think one of the misconceptions about the opposition is that people think of it's, um, it's a, a homogeneous group. I was surprised to find out that there are more than, more than 12 groups, and it ranges anything like from the, in this country, the uh, BNP, EDL, Make Britain Great Again, groups like that, they're absolutely um, awful. They are racist, they are fascistic, and they haven't got grassroots. And uh, when we talk about five municip municipalities of how many? Of 300? 335. So we're talking about a tiny proportion. However, they have the voice, they have the media. They are talking they have international media, they have the ear, and you hear all those spins, like for instance, to compare the play, plebiscite with the elections of the Constituent Assembly, I think is, is absolutely wrong. We cannot compare. One was illegal, was never uh, uh, um, called by the CNE, which will be here, the Electoral Commission. They didn't call, it was not a formal, it was not official, it was not acceptable. It's an exercise, it was a show, and yet the international media take it as if it was compatible. Whereas the other one was a pro properly called, it went according to the constitution, had impartial witnesses. So no, there's no comparison whatsoever. Um, in regards to the media in Latin America, I mean, you can see the, media, the people, the population here confused, but does anybody, do, anybody trust the media? Remember what they did with Corby? Well, the people on our Vox Pop uh, plainly yes. did. 
Yes, but in terms of the international media. But what about Jeremy Corbyn? They did the same to Jeremy Corbyn, nonetheless. And it didn't work. It did, yes. So why so, is it working on Venezuela? Because they don't Corbyn? know. So it's, 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 it's places like these where we can talk and we give alternative information. This is very important. They, we need to provide information to people. How do I know? I searched for information. I went to Venezuela last year. I don't think everybody can do that, but you can go. It's fantastic. Venezuela, for me, to walk around the underground stations, go through, and you see on the wall advertising or, or explanations about how bad Coca-Cola is or how bad junk food is on the wall instead of trying to sell you. It's amazing. And then you talk to people, ordinary people walking on the, on the underground, sitting, people sitting next to you on the bus and telling you about their lives and telling, talking to you about politics. It's fantastic. So the work that the work that was done over the years when Chavez was there, um, the seeds that were planted, you can see the fruits now. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. And this is why they cannot, um, they, the U.S. will not be able to go in, um, physically in, the, in, in Venezuela. However, we have Colombia, and Colombia has many um, U.S. Uh, garrisons, uh, and we need to be aware that we have other type of inventions. We we not may not have direct invention like that, but we have other types of interventions. Like we had the president of Peru, PPK, calling for a meeting and getting all these all these um, people coming around to sanction Venezuela. However, um, it's all show. Because there's all showing uh, n not, not, nothing concrete. However, it's on the news, it's on the media, it's on the headlines, and it gives people the impression that there's something going on against Venezuela. It's a psychological game. And the, what could happen if um, the U.S. invaded um, Venezuela is that in, in the region, uh, every country has... It has their internal struggles. In Peru at the moment, for over a month, the teachers have been on strike and the health workers. And the demands that they have are very, um, they're just simple demands to wage increase and so on. And the government has labeled them as terrorists. And you could see the attacks of them on the streets by the police, but that's not in the media. Nobody hears about it. And yeah, yeah if there was, if there was, uh, an invasion of Venezuela, I think uh, what they fear is like in, in Brazil, people are upset with the government. In Argentina, people are upset with the government. So it will create a destabilization. That's what they fear, is that in their own countries, people will rise up. Um, well, I'm from Bolivia, and what I hear uh, is a lot of negative press about Bolivia as well. They don't, they're not gonna say how wonderful. This is the first president since our independence that did so much for the people, that worked so much for the people. However, there's no international press. Why? Because it's socialist. It's not socialist, but they call it it's socialist and it has to be um, stigmatized. Well, let me ask uh, uh, former mayor Ken Livingston uh, about that because <clears throat> it is on the face of it remarkable. I think I uh, don't find it profoundly remarkable, but on the face of it, it is remarkable that those most liberal Western media outlets, like Channel 4 News, like the Guardian newspaper, and I sympathize with you having to read it every day, <laughs> they are the most hostile to both Chavez and Maduro. How do you account for that? I mean, I find it very difficult to understand. There are very many good journalists and columnists who write honest stuff in The Guardian. But then you get the other side of it. And I think, yes, that's part of the legacy of Blair. I, I mean, an awful lot of people thought, you know, Blair was this wonderful giant. He, only Blair could have won. He's changed the world for better. And that really shifted. Um, a lot of people uh, who were in the, in the Guardian, they were supportive and supportive. And they can't come to terms with the criticism of it. And that, I think, affects the way they view the whole world. Now, they've got a problem at the moment because you, you've got Theresa May leading Britain, I mean, shambolically. You've got a demented Trump in the, the White House. I mean, they haven't got people that they can really... They don't identify. exactly have a champion they can all uh, <laughs> no. rally a bit. And I think this is the thing. I think the, the world could be on a tipping point. I mean, 
at the end of the Second World War, half of the entire global economy was in America, and they managed to dominate the, the, thir you know, the three decades that followed that. But it's got more and more difficult. You look at their disastrous interventions. They've not been able to create the sort of regimes they wanted. Mm -hmm. And I think you look at the support for Bernie Sanders running for the Democrat nomination, Jeremy Corbyn here getting 40%, just 2% behind the Tories. Across the world, people are looking for radical change because they've seen their lives, not just in, in, in the third world, but in America and in Britain and in France. Working class and middle class families are worse off. They know it. When you and I left school, every kid got a job. Now, I mean, that level of unemployment I mean, is, is about 4%. I mean, but so many of those new jobs are low skill, low wage, they're insecure. and Zero hours. Zero hours contracts. People can't afford to rent. They can't afford to buy. They're living with their parents. And this is all over the world. That elite, an international elite, has collared 90% of all the wealth created in the last um, decade since the, the banking crisis. And therefore, I think whether it's the people rallying behind Maduro in Venezuela or people rallying behind Corbyn here, and it's a chance for real global change. And I mean, with such an idiot as Trump capable of creating a catastrophe, you could have the biggest defeat of America um, since its creation. Mm. Is there, though, a, a philosophical point here? Places like The Guardian, Channel 4 News would regard themselves as champions of human rights. They don't seem to be able to see that getting a house is a human right, getting an education is a human right, having a, a good free health service is a human right. For them, human rights are all about whether uh, every opposition politician can say or do what they like, even if they're in the pay of a foreign power and so on. Isn't there a dichotomy there uh, into uh, uh, that, broadly speaking, for socialists, the human rights that matter most are the rights that affect the most people. Mm. Uh, whereas for liberals, like The Guardian, like Channel 4 News, that's not quite or always the case. Yeah, and because, I mean, many of those people are quite well off. They wouldn't like to see an increase in their taxes. I mean, many of them have got you know, substantial uh, assets and things like that. And they know that in a fairer world, I mean, they would have to share some of that with the poor. So they commit themselves to all these nice things about freedom of speech and all of that. And uh, having, you know, they support having gay marriage. But they worry very much about a real shift in economic power away from an American-dominated neoliberal agenda to one I mean, that, that created the world that you know, my generation grew up in a much fairer world. That Labour government after the war, I mean, the top rate of tax was 98%. And I mean, they built 200,000 homes for rent each year. I mean, that was all wept, swept away by Thatcher and, the, and Reagan in America. And I think these people are completely uncertain about where they want to go and how things should be run. The simple fact is, I've met some of the richest people on the face of this planet. I mean, they don't seem terribly happy. Money doesn't make you happy. It's your relationship with your friends, your workmates, your family. That's what defines us as a species, not how much you can uh, stack away in the bloody bank. Fantastic stuff. More after this. Watching Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, discussing Venezuela and Donald Trump's threat that military options were not off the table in dealing with what the United States say is a popular uprising, though it seems to have gone awfully quiet. We took the camera onto the streets of London to see what the people thought. I wasn't impressed by the first lot. Let's see if the second are any better. Do you think imposing sanctions on Venezuela will help the Venezuelans that were against the government? It's hard because there's two sides to every story, so you impose sanctions and it's worse off for everyone. But I think if the leadership of the country can't, you know, adhere to, uh, you know, peaceful, fair political processes, then I think that, I think that there should be sanctions. Remove, even if you remove the sanctions, it wouldn't fix the, the problem in Venezuela. So then you're saying, well, what, what should they do? Well, they should have a much more 
involved, supportive economic program that would develop and re, like you know reshape the country. The problem with that is that you can only have that if you have buy-in from all levels of society, and if you've got a fascistic-style regime in charge, they don't benefit. They benefit from the destabilisation. Well, I think the problem with sanctions, like, well, I guess the same goes for any war or conflict. It's always the people who suffer, you know. That's the problem. You know, it's like, so it doesn't help. So I don't believe in sanctions. Do you think Trump's presidency is a reason behind the increase of conflicts around the world, and especially in Venezuela? I think because he has no prior political experience, you know, he was just a businessman. The way he goes about diplomacy isn't isn't the best at all and the way that he agitates people and agitates other countries isn't really safe on the world stage. So it is hard to say, but I don't think he's helped the situation. Uh, he's not diplomatic at all. I think he has a lot of uh, mental issues and I think it's, uh, it's a big uh, trouble for all the humanity that he runs the biggest country in the world. He has mental issues, but he's got his finger on the button of 7,000 thermonuclear uh, missiles. Please, yes, sir, go ahead. Well, I just want to um, add concepts that maybe help to understand why Venezuela is such a, a, a complex subject to understand how it's possible after so much aggression upon the country, the country is able to stand and still come back 8 million to vote for a president that has been so lowly rated and even mistakes has been made and even though uh, the people stands together around around the figure of the president venezuela has proposed participatory democracy direct democracy building from the bottom a network of decision makers that is just spreading and getting better more qualified better understanding and politics has gone down to the grassroots movement and uh, it's very hard for for a a representative of democracy that we understand here, uh, uh, grasp the mechanics inside a political country that has been politicized so much, polarized so much, and uh, propose a new version of democracy that is not very well understood outside. So when the President Chavez proposed and insists and speak and, is, uh, and, and teach everyone about the participatory democracy, he planned the seeds of a new level that I think is, is about to flourish. So the sanctions against Venezuela will only um, coagulate people together working, understanding by objective and tactics what need, to, what need to be done next. And unfortunately, the opposition in Venezuela is not only attacking the country, it's attacking the model. The participatory democracy take away the power from their hands forever. And there's no way that a representative democracy will, allow, will rely upon the elites anymore. So the attacks of the opposition to Venezuela is attacks on the state, on the nation that Chavez has been fomenting and a new identity has been put in place that everybody feels very proud of because it's a collective construction. And that collective construction does not allow too much space for the elites to be ruling the country any, anytime soon. The only opportunity for the opposition to come back to the paradise that they were living before is to fully eradicate Chavismo, because it cannot coexist. And that is a very dramatic position. And I think peace will prevail. If sanctions doesn't harm us that much, we will flourish. And that is a very positive thing for the world. And if everybody from outside, and this is important for the liberal media that have a very um, hard understanding of meritocracy and they cannot stand a bus driver with the president taking the decision because he's not he's not qualified to take that decision but even though if you see the the all the loot of attacks that the president maduro has been sustaining since he was elected and the first one was the emotional down that means losing president chavez which was the greatest man that we can even imagine mm -hmm. that vacuum has to be filled by president maduro and he take that position and draw the road through so many obstacles that we can just imagine, wow, this guy, um, even if he made mistakes, he has, been able to, he has been able to cope and construct a protecting system that now is just paying off and just, I think, will get better and better. 
So I am very optimistic, and maybe we will show to the world a new version of democracy that is much, much better than the, any liberal philosophy or school can offer. And maybe the Guardian has to go back to Caracas and start learning lesson A, B, C about participatory democracy, and that will be very good. Don't hold your breath for that one. Very good. Who, who else would like to uh, make a contribution? Yes. Go ahead, sir. Um, I'd just like to make two or three points. First of all, recently Ken made a statement. Ken has the habit of speaking the truth, but it arouses such a lot of furor in his own party, or what was his party, um, you know, that the, the, the fault of Chavez was not having lined up these 200 and somehow got rid of them. Well, I think it's a pretty obvious statement. In their own day, the present ruling class did exactly the same. What did they do to Charles I? They didn't say, well, we're going to have a reasonable debate with him because there was going to be no reasonable debate. And every revolution that has taken place, whether it was a great French revolution or whether it was a Bolshevik revolution or much earlier, the English revolution, that is what happens. The revolution is a serious business. You cannot mess, mess with it. And you cannot deprive these people of their heaven by simply saying, well, your time is up because historical circumstances have changed because they, don't, they, they won't accept it. I think that's one thing that needs to be said again and loud and clearly and not leave somebody like Ken to be standing on his own, at being attacked not only by the conservative press but also by the, by, the, by, by the liberal press. Secondly, I really do not expect the newspapers by visiting Krakas to change their mind. I mean, the newspapers, including the liberal, so-called liberal ones, remind me of a bourgeois reviewer of books who said he never read a book before he reviewed just in case it affected his judgment. <laughs> Facts are not something that they like to, to confront. They are inconvenient. They have to be swept out of the way. The only reality that will sink in when people on the ground are changing the world and they eventually got, got to accept, accept the fact. I must, just for the uh, avoidance of doubt, make it clear that Ken was not in any sense calling for the elimination of uh, anybody in Venezuela. He was making the point that it's some kind of dictatorship that you're maligning that actually left all these people still standing with, with all of their wealth. It was a, the point he was making was that, f that, that the Maduro government is not a dictatorship. Because how can it be? If it were, all these people wouldn't have the power that they have. Yes, madam. Hi, my, my name is Ella Rawl. I'm an editor of Proletarian. And I would like to put in some defense for Chavez and Maduro, because people have said they made mistakes. Uh, we haven't really heard what the mistakes were, other than that they left the bourgeoisie in place. But um, as uh, Paul pointed out now, the bourgeoisie doesn't leave the scene quietly. If you try and snatch even a uh, thousand pounds from them, uh, ask them if that in tax, well, they rise up in arms and you ask for more than that and they've, their arms are literally firing in the street as we see in Venezuela at the moment. They're very happy to defend their property rights with the death of millions if necessary. Um, and the thing is that no individual on his own is, can counter that. You have to be able to bring the masses of ordinary people with you because the masses of the ordinary people are the ones who are going to pay the price in blood when these people rise up and try and squash the revolutionary movement. And if the people aren't ready, there's no point in jumping the gun. And what I think that uh, Chavez and Maduro have done is actually create circumstances where, first of all, the masses have got a stake in defending uh, uh, the society. And secondly, they're learning what the real nature of these people that they've been in the habit of respecting. They, they realize what these people are, what poisonous, dangerous, uh, criminal people they are, and they are ready to be mobilized. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Maduro has made noises, quite a few, about the fact that it's going to be necessary to uh, expropriate the capitalist class now in the light of what it's doing. And I think he is preparing the working class and the uh, dispossessed masses of Venezuela to do just that. Uh, let's take the lady at the front. 
And what happening in Venezuela is that in Venezuela is a, <coughs> is a democracy, uh, sorry, democracy that is very well, is very well thought. It's the vision of Chavez, who is um, who was a, a, a great thinker and is respected, respected around the world. And what the opposition in Venezuela is doing is forcing the socialism to become alive because there is a big part of the population that needs the socialism. And they have to have a voice. They have to, uh, to, to become part of that country to, to be able to develop to its full mm. potential. But the opposition is also, um, is also there and is part of the country and is, is playing its role in there. We hope that uh, an opposition that is able to uh, relate to the country mm. come up because the opposition that we have at the moment is a kind of uh, pop like like Trump or Macri from Argentina or Macron from wherever. And th this is just people who have been rich all their life and they, they don't understand anything about politics. The only thing that they understand is that the resources belong to them, to them and they do what they want with them, which is give it to the international corporation and get some percentage of it. Thank you. Last uh, speaker, I think. Uh that we have time for, who, the gentleman right at the back. Hi, uh, my name's Jerry Douglas. I've been blogging a few years um, on, uh, about economics in general, um, as I started a few years back in the um, financial in industry in the UK. Um, basically, through a lot of research, I've discovered that um, the media is probably the biggest factor in these problems. It's basically, uh, we have a, a, a Basically, what, the way I, I see it is a pro-neoliberalist -ne state, which is uh, basically on it, all the continents of the world. Um, it's intent on taking control uh, and enforcing corrupt cap capitalism, debt-fueled capitalism on the world. And uh, it's basically, uh, it, it, it controls the media, and also and not just the media, but education. And it tells the, the, the ordinary people that um, capitalism works. And basically, my conclusions are basically, without the control of the media, it would collapse. Well, I think people have to make their own uh, media. Uh, there's no future in taking control of the media. You have to develop your, your own media. And everyone has that potentiality now. Uh, we are the media here. I am on my, my radio show, on my television shows, on my one million followers on social media. Uh, we, we, we all have to do that. We all have to search for the information that we can find. Ignorance is now, in Western countries, a choice that people are making. Last word to you. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's slightly more difficult I see, the way I see it, um, because uh, they have control of our access to the media. What we need to spread the word on is that the media is, uh, is basically corrupt throughout the world, not just in Venezuela, uh, but obviously here in the UK, we've only got to look at the last election. Um, you know, we were told in the lead up to no, the election... I, 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 I think the opposite. What Jeremy Corbyn's phenomenal achievement proved is the limits of media power. Uh, they subjected him to precisely the same kind of demonization that we've been discussing here uh, this evening, and it completely failed and Corbyn confounded them all. And let's hope Venezuela can do the same. It's been marvellous. Thanks for watching. <laughs>